Hey, friends and comrades. I've heard the word civilization all my life. But in the past 10 years or so, I've come to start thinking about what it actually means. It's not just a way of saying where people come from or of talking about history. Civilization is part of millions of people's identities nowadays. And like the nation and the race, two other ways of turning people into groups, civilization as we know it is mostly the product of lies and violence. The lies and the violence in the name of civilization haven't stopped yet. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. You might want to watch my video, What is the State, before you watch this one, if you haven't already, because civilization has mostly been a state project. And even though society has existed without the state, there's very little recorded history of mass society without the existence of the state. What we call civilization could exist without the state, but to learn the origins and guiding forces of civilization, it's important to know the origins and guiding forces of the state. I once heard a lecture by a historian who said he couldn't really find any consistently used definition for civilization except mass society with more division of labor than outside civilization. In other words, there are more people, so it's more efficient to specialize. That's it. He added that usually there is some kind of writing, cities, and agriculture, but not in every case. If that explanation doesn't seem like it says much, that's because it's tough to define what civilization is without talking about what it's not. Civilization has more than one meaning nowadays, but all its meanings have been conditioned by their supposed opposites, and those opposites are related. You'll see what I mean. First, civilization has always existed as opposed to barbarism. Wherever states have existed, they've assured their subjects with every propaganda tool at their disposal that the subjects are so much better off than those miserable barbarians who don't have the state. They don't have the one true religion, just paganism. They don't have culture like we do. They run wild and hurt each other. We have law and order. We have science, philosophy, logic, enlightenment. Barbarians are not capable of reasoning like us. And sure, we kill people too, but the ways we kill people and the reasons why we kill people are much more, well, civilized than theirs. So the idea of civilization in this sense of the word emerged as the ruling class, the beneficiaries of civilization, wanted to persuade their subjects existence was much better with them in charge. Even today, the worst consequence anyone can think of for anything is civilization itself would collapse. Second, we've always conflated the idea of civilization with behaving according to pointless rules that only people with a high social position would know. You don't burp in front of people. How uncivilized! Well, why? It's just a noise. Well, it's the rule. Don't eat with your elbows on the table. How barbaric! Why? <laughs> Again, these are just rules handed down to us from the ruling class. If we want to present ourselves as potential material for the ruling class, or if we ever have to serve them, we need to observe all these arbitrary rules. And in fact, during the time of European empires, these rules served not only to contrast the civilized European from the barbarians they were invading and exploiting, but also to divide the upper-class beneficiaries of the empire from the masses wallowing in poverty. 
the people who followed the rules could distinguish themselves as civilized and therefore had something to be proud of. The people on top, uh, they do what they do uh, to instill awe in their masses, so the masses want to emulate their behavior, along with their clothes, and that's how these things eventually trickle down to everyone. Nowadays, of course, we don't use the words quite the same way, but the prejudices are still very real and have the same consequences. Barbarian used to mean people who just lived outside the territory claimed by states or empires. It was claimed civilized people needed to kill and subdue the barbarians for their own good and for the good of civilization. Really, of course, they wanted to subdue those people to protect their own rule from invasion and wherever possible to expand the power of their states. So the various calls to civilize the barbarians were really calls to kill and conquer. Is it different now? Well, what were the U.S. government's excuses for its wars of the past 20 years? Well, it, they mostly amounted to keeping white Christians safe from brown Muslims to kill the people threatening the existence of our culture and civilization and transform their whole societies so that they act right. Is that really different from the old empires and kings? George W. Bush called the murders of 9-11 a call to defend freedom. Then he said, Americans are asking us, I won't do it. <laughs> Why do they hate us? They hate what we see here in this chamber, a democratically elected government. Their leaders are self-appointed. They hate our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. And the, the tiny percentage of people who actually knew things about terrorism and Al-Qaeda before 9-11 all went, what? They never said any of that. But it's part of drawing the us versus them lines. Civilized people like us have democracy and freedom. Whoever we designate as barbarians are people who hate freedom. In the same speech, Bush used the words progress, pluralism, and tolerance. You might notice whenever people talk about so-called Western civilization and its values today, they use those words. And if you get how propaganda works, it won't surprise you that most of the people who use those words to talk about how much better their civilization is are not very progressive pluralist, or tolerant. In the same speech, he said Al-Qaeda, uh, those were the folks who carried out the destruction of the World Trade Center, for those of you whose memory is based on the news. Al-Qaeda wanted to remake the world and impose its radical beliefs on everyone, everywhere. He failed to mention they had never had any chance of succeeding. I mean, I'd like to be able to remake the world in a way that would suck for George Bush, but they're not invading me. He talked about how bad people had it in Afghanistan, the obvious implication being the U.S. military would go there, and the violence and oppression would stop. Or at least, the barbaric violence would stop. Of course, there would be civilized violence, but that's always got the best of intentions. And I gave the example of George W. Bush <clears throat> because of what a formula, formative time that was in my life. But you can look up any war speeches from any president of the U.S. and you'll hear something similar. You can go right back to the European colonization of the Americas to find the roots of this kind of propaganda to make white people think they were superior. If whites could think of themselves as superior, they could be employed to kill Indians or keep slaves from running away. 
right from the Jamestown colony in the early 1600s, whites would run away to join the Indians. The European colonies were strictly religious, patriarchal, and law and order societies that didn't have the same kind of freedom as any of the native populations surrounding them. For various reasons, the moneyed classes of these colonies found it useful to make war and even genocide on the natives. So they did. So the line between the barbarians, i.e. the locals, and the civilized people, i.e. the invaders, had to be described and taught and enforced by law. And when they started bringing in slaves, soon enough they found the need to divide white indentured servants from black slaves. So they gave the white people legal privileges and filled their heads with lies about black people, ensuring that over time most white people would no longer think of black people as equally deserving of respect and freedom and life. That's how this civilization-barbarism divide makes us think. Who cares about those people? They're not as civilized as us. So now you can see this issue is fundamental to understanding the construction of us versus them in history and right now. Civilization is a process, not just of demarcating the superior and the inferior, but also of making the inferior like the superior, bringing them up to our level. That's why the civilizing mission has been one popular way to get well-meaning people behind the expansion of states and empires. You know about the civilizing mission and the white man's burden, don't you? It was, or is, the call for white people to spread their superior culture around the world for the benefit of non-white people. Really, it's a call for violence to benefit people who are already rich, but it's also a call for well-meaning white people to spread their culture around the world, despite the violent results. One reference I've recommended on here before and will likely recommend again is The Art of Not Being Governed by James C. Scott. Take a look at the first page of Chapter 4, Civilization and the Unruly. The permanent settlement of populations is, along with taxes, perhaps the oldest state activity. It has always been accompanied by a civilizational discourse in which those who are settled are presumed to have raised their cultural and moral level. While the rhetoric of high imperialism could speak unselfconsciously of civilizing and Christianizing the nomadic heathen, such terms strike the modern ear as outdated and provincial, or as euphemisms for all manner of brutalities. And yet, if one substitutes the nouns development, progress, and modernization, it's apparent that the project under a new flag is very much alive and well. So how do they civilize people? How do they subdue and incorporate people into the state? How do they turn hunter-gatherers and pastoralists and tribes and settlements into tax-paying, law-abiding subjects of the state? Well, you'll need to read the whole chapter for details, but, spoiler alert, violence! Lots of violence over a long period of time. And we live with the effects of that violence today. Surely not every state, Chris. Yes, every state. There are no exceptions. People who think states began as voluntary institutions are wrong, and there's no historical evidence to back up that belief. All states began in the conquest of barbarians, which, if we strip it down, just means killing and enslaving people they didn't care about. And because these barbaric people are in need of civilization, and because they're not wise and advanced like us, we have nothing to learn from them. As a result, there's no way for the civilized person to see their point of view. 
It doesn't matter what the people who are being treated as barbarians are saying. Barbarians can't speak and can't be understood. In the book Bar Barbarism and Its Discontents, in an essay full of insights into the modern state, Maria Boletzi writes, Myth safeguards civilized knowledge from barbarisms and is indispensable for the nation's identity construction. Therefore, he, a character, decides that his narrative cannot accommodate any more questioning. Civilized knowledge does not jeopardize itself by opening up to foreign knowledge or self-interrogation. When I first read that, <clears throat> I immediately thought of the time when Barbara Bush was asked about the flag-draped coffins that would be coming home thanks to her son's foreign policy. Why should we hear about body bags and deaths? It's not relevant. So why should I waste my beautiful mind on something like that? Why indeed? So civilized people can't understand why 9-11 happened. Why people would be so angry with the United States they would kill thousands of people. They just listened to the justifications from their rulers and didn't trouble their beautiful minds. So our rulers can continue to live the high life as long as they instill in us a fear of the other. The barbarian is foreign and different and therefore frightening. A barbarian is a potential threat, part of a faceless mass bent on destroying us. To white American conservatives, Muslims and Latino people are barbarians. Of course, they would never admit it, but we see it when they talk about them online, or when they accuse people based on nothing but their appearance of being illegals and terrorists. They talk about terrorism or the law, but those are just excuses for locking the scary brown people in concentration camps and making war on them all around the world. And they consider liberals a fifth column because they don't blindly hate America's enemies. By the way, for what's coming up, content warning for violence and Islamophobia and outright genocide. But I just want to give you a taste of the things that I've seen online uh, over years of researching this topic, so that you know I'm not making it up. Right-wing Americans are surrounded by all kinds of imaginary threats, and they support any kind of violence against real people, including indefinite detention, torture, war in any part of the world, and, of course, a trillion-dollar military budget, and some of them go so far as to call for genocide. Here are some examples of that if you really want to pause and find out. I could, of course, point out that the odds that a white American will die at the hands of a non-white Muslim or Latino person are lower than the odds of almost any other cause of death you could think of. But these people don't know and don't want to know statistics. They've learned to be afraid. That's enough to keep them supporting the people in power, regardless of how much their policies conflict with the stated ideals of the civilization they claim to speak and fight for, like freedom. In these times of heightened security, so all the time now, Freedom is a luxury we just can't afford. Bombing people or putting them in concentration camps is an action. It seems to advance so-called national security, that catch-all excuse that scares people into giving up their money and freedom. What the brown people do, even if it's just crossing an invisible line on the ground, is never acceptable always worthy of suspicion and even a violent response, because they're barbarians. 
Our violence is only in reaction to what they're doing to us. We're innocent. We're justified. We're civilized. And like I say, turning people into barbarians is a process. Turning Arabs and Muslims into the face of terrorism had started at least a decade before 9-11, as the perceived Soviet threat fizzled out. The Pentagon and Hollywood, sometimes working together, fed off the news coverage of the occasional hijacking by an Arabic speaker in a ski mask. They helped solidify the association between the entire Middle East or Arab world or Muslim world. After all, how many Americans do you think can explain the differences among those three terms? And terrorism or bombs or ski masks or other apparently inexplicable and unjustifiable violence. Americans and whoever else saw those movies were primed to see 9-11 as an act of senseless barbarism, rather than an event with causes. And not being able to hear the barbarians, they've never tried to analyze the events outside the frame of reference handed to them. People still say they hate us for who we are, rather than they hate us for our shitty policies. So the wars can continue, as long as rulers continue to paint it as a conflict between civilization and barbarism. They just sometimes use different words. Thanks for listening, everyone. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe, too. See you next week for part two.